Well, hello everyone. This is Lee Andrews with Akatha May, and I am um, honored to have with us today on um, Live with Lee, um, Ms. Cheryl D. Miller. We should actually add the um, the other name that she's probably more known by, which completely is escaping me at the moment. Holmes. <laughs> Holmes. Holmes. Holmes Miller. And um, let me just get situated on all my screens here to make sure that I see all your comments and questions. We are taking comments, questions on YouTube as well as LinkedIn. So feel free to uh, join us at that, that either one of those locations. It looks like people are hopping on now. So we're going to get right to it. Um, and this is, this is how the universe works for me. I'm just sitting at my, my laptop, minding my own business, you know, doing what I do. And then this woman emails me or uh, IMs me through LinkedIn with a bunch of content about, you know, how we could do a, a live broadcast together. And I'm like, okay, let me do some research here. When I found out who was sending me messages, I just about fell on the floor. As you get to hear um, Cheryl's story in the design domain of her career, you are going to um, take away, hopefully, some key points about realization versus actualization, how a life um, in stress and a world in distress can create opportunity, um, having the fortitude to follow through on what is inside your heart and your soul uh, to make that change uh, evident, and then, you know, having a knowledge of not just your craft in design, but the business acumen, applying your craft to the world that you live in, particularly in business to be heard. So we're going to start with, I have a, a series of questions to ask Cheryl, and they're futuristic questions. They're not about going too far into her past, but to explain her position on the future, we need to understand her past. So she will connect those dots for us on today's broadcast. And Cheryl, again, thank you so much. We are honored uh, to have you with us today. And the first question, Cheryl. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Is there anything about yourself that I missed? Is there, is there no, okay. <laughs> so the first question we have today, the pandemic has caused many designers, graphic and digital designers, including in that user experience, all, all, all across the spectrum of design, to lose their jobs. How can they possibly inside their own minds, find opportunity during such a difficult time, period. Yeah, how, how do they do that? Well, um, first off, Lee, and to everybody who's watching, um, I'm always so honored uh, to have an opportunity to share. Um, and I am always um, so involved with telling my story and this infamous article and my career. Um, to ask me about what's going on now, I'm honored, okay, because I'm still in the land of the living. Uh, I'm a baby boomer, and I'm happy to say that um, I have fantastic genes. This is original. There's no gray, <laughs> very little. Uh, my mom didn't gray until uh, mid-70s, and it's just in the gene pool, so um, I'm, I'm happy for that. <laughs> and um, so let's, before I start rambling, let's, let's, Let's um, talk about what's in my mind. And um, I think that's helpful, uh, that this is what I'm doing, this is what I'm seeing. And my hope is by the time we finish sharing that something that I have said, um, your audience will be, um, will glean some inspiration and, um, and, and look forward into this crazy scenario um, we are all in, okay? But there's a place, a great opportunity. Um, and so with that, um, you know, I have some points that I think are very important. And these are the things that that uh, I, I am looking um, at for myself. First off, um, I have, so I'm, I'm, I'm not even gonna speak to you should. This is what I have, okay? Which is very, very helpful. And so you can, like, like we say in, in seminary, we can eat the fish and spew out the bones of this. This is how I'm processing this. Um, first off, uh, I have had to accept that the paradigm shift has shifted. So, you know, we've always heard intellectual dialogue and theological dialogue, you know, the shift is coming, the shift is coming, the shift is coming. Guess what? The shift has shifted. <laughs> okay. And I think that um, 
a lot of us aren't, well, I've had to have my own reality check that change has occurred. And, you know, some of the things when we look back at major um, changes of, 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 of culture and lifestyle, I'm old enough to rewind and remember there was a time when cars did not have seatbelts. Okay. And you could just throw your kids in the back of the car and the shift shifted. You cannot, you, you cannot drive without seatbelts. Okay. Um, the car seats for kids, baby car seats, you could, I can remember, you know, my dad had big Cadillacs. They throw everybody in the back of the car and we just kind of roll all around. <laughs> you can't, you can't drive a baby without a car seat. These things have shifted. And the major shift that I think, um, which is contemporary and, and maybe the generation that I'm speaking to, we completely understand. You know, I live, I, you know, after resolving out of the mid Atlantic into New York City and, and doing business there, you know, I live in Connecticut now and I'm 40, 45 minutes on a good day in traffic um, to LaGuardia Airport. Um, I can remember back in the day before 9-11, um, I could get to the airport and fly, park my car or get drop, dropped off. And, you know, I, I'd be at the gate in, uh, what, 45 minutes, literally 45 minutes on a good day. Well, now you've got a plan. I will never get to LaGuardia Airport and on a plane in the seat in 45 minutes. Okay, because of 9-11, that's an example of a shift. It will take me, I've got to prepare myself to leave my home and to be at an airport two and a half, if not three hours in out of LaGuardia Airport or JFK. Okay. Um, that is lifestyle now. To for me to get to JFK, I've got to be there and prepare myself to be at that gate two hours before um the, the flight. Okay, so that's an example of um accepting that change has occurred. Unfortunately, we're kind of like right in the middle of this and we can't see the aftermath of exactly what's not coming back. But some things are not coming back. And the first thing we have to accept is that we've got to accept, all right? And I am I, I have my own little motto about re-entry. It's real simple for me. Um, when the hospitals, here's my guideline, when the hospitals let visitors back in, that's when I'm coming out. So all this re-entry and all the governors and the White House and the this, that, and the other, I have, I'm, I'm watching, I'm watching the hospitals, okay? So when I can go visit, then I know that I can come out of the hospital, <laughs> okay? So you've got to really listen to yourself um, and, this is a time of retooling and reframing and replanning and to try to anticipate um, what, the, what the eternal change will be. Some things are not coming back. And so with that, we've got to be able to look into that and to not focus on, you know, if we're in the middle of a fire, you wouldn't want to stand still and burn in it. You have to keep running and see a light and a vision to move through. So right now we're in this, you know, we're in the flames. And I'm saying, okay, all right, we're in the flames, but I'm not standing still in this. You know, I'm I'm going to project and vision out, and that's what's going to guide me out of this. All right, I, I want to see into the future. I want to see out of this. I want to see. Um, what won't be returning and how I fit into this. So a part of this is accepting and so, and retooling. So this, you know, I love to give examples and metaphors so we can <laughs> look at it. So as example, GM is making ventilators. This being retooled. Haynes, they're making masks. Okay. I say when there's a gold rush, we make shovels. Okay. <laughs> we make shovels and don't be, don't be bashful about it. All right, we're in the middle of a gold rush and our job is to make sh shovels if we're going to survive this. And so um, that's a piece of um, accepting the shift, retooling, reframing, replanning, 
Um, and one of the things that I'm doing as, as an example, um, and again, you know, I'm talking about me. All right, I had a plan for semi-retirement. And, and, and a lot of times we learn by examples. I had a plan for semi-retirement. And my semi-retirement plan was, I'm going to, you know, I, my maternal family is from uh, the U.S. Virgin Islands, St. Thomas. And um, I uh, had a plan that I would semi-retire, I would snowboard and get my kid, my last kid in college and um, take off um, at Thanksgiving time, go down, paint, open a gallery, come back after what is carnival time, which is now, and spend, spend the summers here, okay? And I would paint St. Thomas scenes, and open a gallery in St. Thomas, business number two. Well, the first thing that happened is Irma and Maria um, wiped my home out. I have a home there. And I'm like, okay, so what's going on with that plan? <laughs> so I had to shift. So I said, okay, I'll start painting anyway. I'll start painting anyway. I collected a lifetime of images and archives and fractals and vacation pictures. And I've been filming and photographing um, uh, the U.S. Virgin Islands my whole life. It's my, my maternal family's there. So I said, okay, so that's, so the hurricane blew my house away. I'm going to start painting. So I'm going along and I am also doing, um, I'm, I'm, I'm very much a designer. So I'm developing an abstract expressionist 21st century catalog of contemporary art in my island scenes. I'm going to open up a gallery. Okay, so I was gonna have two galleries, one in St. Thomas and one in Connecticut and do the art market thing and have my wine and cheese in New York. And, you know, I had already gotten curated into um, uh, the, the, um, uh, one of the art ed shows. You know, I was on my way and then all of a sudden we're here. Okay, no gallery. I'm still painting, no gallery, no physical gallery, no going to New York, none of all of that. And I, I, I opened up an online gallery. Now we'll come back and talk about that, but I finally got that thing flourishing. So what I'm saying, <laughs> what I'm saying is you gotta keep, yeah, they're buying my prints, prints crazy. All right, that's not what I expected, but keep shifting and working, you know, with, um, these shit, you know, with these paradigm changes, uh, you've got to look into the future and anticipate and make shovels. And so even, okay, so like, I know this is, this is, you're going to chuckle at this, but as I was going into the art market kind of thing and going to, you know, I was like, oh, sure, you got to come up with an art look. <laughs> you know, you can't go to New York and not, you, you can't go down there looking like, you can't, you gotta have an art look, right? So I'm trying to figure out, all right, well, what's gonna be my art look? I knew what my corporate look was. Well, what's gonna be my art look? You know, I'm sure you're too old for orange hair and all of that. You can't, you know, what are you gonna do? So I was working on this um, uh, uh, black turtleneck and pearl, you know, kind of um, Chanel look. And, you know, I come in with an older look, <laughs> more mature look. Well, guess what? I got to look. Look at me. I don't, wait. I can't get, this is shifting. I can't get, I can't get to get my hair blown. Oh, thank God I don't have great issues, so I can't color. Okay. Um, I'm working on, I still have my pearls and things. I'm working on my Chanel look. You know, my older, mature <laughs> artist, design, curator. I can't get out. <laughs> So, so let's go back. So the main question is, how do you find opportunity during this time? And what I'm hearing you say, you came, you gave us the bullet points of, of what you're trying to, what you're, you're saying. But what I hear underneath all of that, Cheryl, is I don't hear desperation. No. I don't hear, I mean, everything was pulled out from under you. The, the rug was completely pulled out from under you, just like it is everybody else or so many people. There are some people who still have a, a rug firmly under their feet uh, in the design world, but your rug was completely pulled away. And here you are saying, okay, so the rug shifted. The rug is still there, but it's in a different location. It might be a little further from my feet, but I, I see the one thing that runs through your story is this fortitude thing. 
Yes. And so give you just to give you another little teeny example. So I had for year, for at least the last five years in this retooling, all right, I put up this online gallery. So so people want my originals and the prints are a whole other thing, but I, I have loaded up this gallery with images. And so now I'm retooling even what I'm saying. So this morning, um, well, a couple of days ago, I put up a collection of flowers. I, I do different studies, you know, Matisse and this, that, and the other. And I have them all over my computer. So I loaded them up in the gallery. And I said, I'm, here's an example of leaning into it, all right, making a shovel. So I'm not, I don't send me any flowers for Mother's Day. I don't want any deliveries. I just figured out UPS. I just figured out my groceries. <laughs> I just figured out FedEx. I don't want to figure out receiving a plant or flowers or anything. So, um, and and there, unfortunately, there are people, our friends, especially in New York, a lot are are expiring and 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 you know their lives are finishing out. So I'm like, let's retool. You don't have to buy in these galleries. You don't have to buy a print. Buy a pillow or a blanket. So I'm now promoting um, comfort pillows. Wait, what? <laughs> You are a formally trained artist and designer, graphic designer, and you are now selling pillows, comfort pillows, along with your uh, artwork in your yeah, gallery. The online gallery. What I'm saying is, you know, it's forced me into online virtual space. I can't, I can't do the art market thing. I can't go to New York. I can't have my wine and cheese. Okay, right. and I had been in, lo I had loaded up and trying all Sachi and you know. Society Six and Fine Art. I've got stuff all over the place, okay? So finally, what I'm saying is the life's events pushed me into, okay, well, let me look at my online gallery and I'm not gonna worry about selling my canvases because people, collectors, you know, let me look at these images in another way and let me look at where I am in another way. And so I put up, as an example, I put up a collection of flowers studies, just paintings that I've done. And now I've said, I've said to my online community, don't send flowers, send a pillow wow. and you use my flower images. Okay. So, um, so I'm repurposing the product and the image for a new meaning. Nobody, I don't want flower deliveries. So send a pillow and a virtual flower and even bereavement. I'm saying send something of comfort. Okay, a bereavement gift, a pillow, a, a blanket. Uh, would I love to be in the? Would I love to invite you for wine and cheese in New York City <laughs> for the collectors? <laughs> of course. Okay. Do I want to find a virtual way to repurpose my art in the lives of? So I'm leaning into this pandemic and finding ways. Okay, to use to be the solution. So I, I think. Yeah, I have. I give that an example of retooling, replanning. I'm GM. I'm making ventilators. I mean, you know, I really wanted collectors for the canvases and the this and the that. Listen, I've got images and they bring joy. So I loosen up and I'm saying, hey, print it on a pillow and send it to your loved one. You know, print the flowers on a yeah. pillow, send it to mom. You know, and it's now, it's now for the first time in five years is what I'm saying. That's awesome. So let's get. We've got four other key questions that I, that I want to make sure that people who are watching get your answers to. And the second is, um, you know, so there is an article that you wrote in the 60s, right? Was it 60s or 70s? I can't remember. 80, 80, 87. Oh, 87. Okay, sorry. So it was in the 87. It still lives on today. Yes. Um, it, you have carried that throughout your career. You have, um, you're a teacher. You are a commissioned uh, fine artist. You are a businesswoman who has delivered graphic design solutions to organizations. So if you would talk to us, um, when I talk to you, none of that ever is anything that you set out to become or do. You didn't, nowhere in your story did you say that I wanted to win all these awards. I wanted to be awarded all this, this work. And, and I wanted to be, you, none of that did you say. No. So how, how, what do you attribute? Well, 
first off is I identified early that I was the only one. Everybody has an only one it factor, okay? Oh. And you've got to find it. This In this quiet solitude time, you have got to find, I, I assessed early when I was a child, three years old, that I had a gift. And my gift is different than your gift and any other artist's gift, okay? We each have a unique it factor. And I knew my it factor very, very young. And so I kept, I have always worked with it. And it's my responsibility. I have a model. Um, God gave me a gift. What I do with it is my gift back to God. Okay. So I know that I'm the only one with certain things. And so I've, I've never veered from that. I've never tried to be anything other than telling and selling that only one, one gift. And see the depth and the richness of my career I had three three main points, okay? First off, I had a purpose, I had a mission, and I had an advocacy. I'll say that one again. I had a purpose, a mission, and an advocacy. My purpose was to be a visual artist, okay? And why the arts want to split the left hand from the right hand? I'm an accomplished graphic designer. There's no, there's, there's no ands, ifs, or buts about that, okay? And um, I'm a beautiful fine artist. All right, and what they wanna do is separate you, okay? So the fine art, you can't be a designer, a designer, you can't be a fine artist. But the whole time I was building my design career, I have a vintage collection of beautiful paintings that have never been released, <laughs> okay? And now they're being released as collectors, stuff I've done through, you know, through, um, through my design career. You're a piano and, you know, if you're gonna play the piano, you just don't play the right hand, you know, the melody, you gotta play the bass. And so I knew early on, I, I can play the piano and no one is gonna separate me from that, all right? So so first off is I had a purpose. My purpose is I'm a visual artist and it's and I'm proficient as an applied artist and, and a fine artist, okay? I, I didn't separate them. I said, I want to be a visual artist. I wanna be an artist and whatever that means, I'm not gonna let anybody um, separate that or put me in a box from the time I was three years old. However you can express that, I am an artist, period. Okay. So I had a purpose. Then I had a mission. My mission was based on historical framework. When I look back now and you ask me this question, I just won an award and they, they're the ones that branded me. I had no branding statement. I always say everybody wants to make a branding statement, but you got, you, there's nothing to brand. Okay do the business, do your life, and then it gets branded, all right? But I've lived a whole life for someone to give me an award and then in a promo say, the corporate communications design firm that defined the civil rights era. Oh, who knew I was doing that? I didn't even know I was in the civil rights era. <laughs> I was young, I'm like, okay. So I was born before the civil rights era. I went, I went, I, I journeyed through the civil rights era. I went to art school through the civil rights era. And then I opened up a business post civil rights. So. You know, I, I dropped into an historical timeline and that's why I was recording history. Everything I was doing was recording history. Did I know I was doing that? No. And so now when somebody looks back and wants to give me a award or write something about me, it's a corporate communications design firm that defined the civil rights era. Well, who knew? I didn't know. And so with that, I but I knew I had a mission, Lee. I didn't know I was branding civil rights corporate communications in ephemera. I had a mission and my mission was, I knew that the major African-American organizations after the civil rights movement were in, um, they were in a push for corporate sponsors, funding, grants, um, all kinds of things to be established. So I knew that I had come out prepared to make fancy books. I know how to make fancy, I, if it's on white paper, I can make it look fancy. And my mission was, oh, guys, you got to be dressed up. We can't, you can't go to IBM. You can't go to Pepsi. You can't go to McDonald's looking like the back of a church bulletin. You can't do that. Okay. And so I saw a need. And I said I was the solution. And I was not afraid Lee, to go to national organizations and say, I can dress you up for this party. And there's no one else that can do this. And so I had a, I had a vision for high-end corporate communications. And then, you know, I got to New York City with that. 
and the doors open up, which is a whole nother show, how that happened. Um, I got corporate work and my charge for the corporate work was it's time campers for us as a corporate community to put people of um, color, but at that time it was mostly black, black faces and the Hispanic community wasn't as prevalent. It was mostly um, the Puerto Rican community. It, it, it wasn't large, we, you know, this melting pot is, is, you know, it's grinding and melting and mixing and blending. But back then it was predominantly, they made a commitment. Okay, let's begin to put African-American faces in. So, you know, I'm the only one that's doing corporate communications for high end fancy books. And now they're gonna integrate some faces of uh, some African-American faces in. So they call me um, to do this. So their corporate responsibility books and sort, you know, and, and reports and all that kind of things. All right, I knew, you know, and, and they had these corporate relationships. So IBM would sponsor different African American or Time Inc or Chase or American um, American Express or anybody on Sixth Avenue, you know, at McDonald's, Pepsi, everybody, they're beginning. And so I was the lady, call Miller, call Cheryl D. Miller Design. She will know how to integrate our literature and our high end pieces. I wasn't into advertising or sales promotion. I'm into the coffee table books. Okay. And so, so I had two, I had a twofold mission with one, I had an incredible um, business template that was just unbelievable. I would do corporate work, corporate communications work, C-suite work, putting in, um, changing the corporate iconography to reflect the, a diverse community, beginning with African-American faces in, into the, 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 the corporate um, books and so forth. And then because I could command and I delivered, I, I had a heart for business. So, so with that, we delivered and we followed through, we kept budgets and, you know, I met time frames and so forth. And we, because we delivered, then they sent me as an in-kind service. They paid for me in many instances to go to African-American organizations that they were sponsoring. So thus, we have this portfolio of national work that the corporations were, uh, the corporate communications was, they were, the you know, the pieces were enhanced because a corporation paid for me to go over to United United Negro College Fund, the National Urban League, the, um, the uh, Congressional Black Caucus Foundation and all these things. So I'm collecting all of this work, all right? Not knowing that I'm really, I'm photographing, I'm writing, I've got compilations. And then, you know, I saw, so then I had an advocacy. I had an advocacy. So my mission, I had a purpose, I had a mission and I had an advocacy. My advocacy was every time I got a piece of work, I found someone that I could bless. This is where it started. I found someone in New York City that was my peer that, uh, come on, do this project with me, you know? so. Now, when I look at my whole collection, my professional portfolio, all of my writings in my ar archives at Stanford University, all my whole studio and my, you know, those people that teamed up with me, everybody is a footnote. You know, I've got my, my artists, my photographers, my writers, you know, we are all in this collection of documenting corporate communications that have defined the civil rights era. Did I know I was doing that? I did not. And I realized that when Regina Roberts from Stanford came to my house, she flew from California Lee to my house in Connecticut, spent five days, four nights in Stanford, came to my house every night. Oh my God. And she opened each book. Was she looking at design? Well, yeah, the, I had a, dining, a, a basement full of beautiful, beautiful um, publications. What she saw was, footnotes and annotations for all the people that I'm shooting, I'm telling their stories, all of these event books and things, all she could see was annotations out. And the collection is for five, who knew? Five schools, five schools she wanted my collection and the last being designed. So I had an advocacy, I had purpose, mission and advocacy. And if you can kind of put that into your thinking about why you're designing and what you're doing, see a problem and be the solution. Then I look back and I can understand. I can understand why people would want, you know, my work because like right now, that's why it's so important that um, the Corona 
information, oh my God. Right. In, in, you're like, listen, the infographics, the, you know, even everything that's there for you to document. All I did was got samples, saved it, threw it in a box. Okay, stop right there because what you just said, just a big light switch went on. So even if you aren't being commissioned to do something, and this I think is really what you did, you weren't being commissioned initially to do what you were doing. You did it because you saw a need, that there yeah. was a gaping hole. You knew that you had the talent to create something that would have meaning, and then you put it out there. And then lo and behold, the world latched on. So. So when you've got designers, what is in, in just less than a minute, if you have a designer sitting in front of you and they say, I am out of job, I don't have a job right now. I don't know what to do with myself. I'm not feeling, um, you know, successful. I don't feel as though I have enough to offer. I can't compete with other people. What would you tell? What would you tell them? Make your job design. Yeah. Make your job design. You can't wait. Okay, so give you an example. This is, I mean, this is really, I put it up on LinkedIn. Find the disenfranchisement in the business, okay, in the business community. So let's just take one that we are understanding, food. <laughs> food. And let's even take it down to a local, local level. Your favorite restaurant doesn't know what to do, okay? Um, going in calling because we can't do anything now but in, invite you know your local restaurant into a zoom and talk about how they can survive if you're a designer okay so deliver the covid menu take out create the covid local hamburger menu take out menu okay the signage that goes on the door that says we'll be back take out I mean, really lean into this, make shovels. Okay, where, where we get hooked up is in being enchanted about a designer and being a, enchanted about the, you know, the awards and the this and the that and the other that, that goes with, oh my God, let's have a reality check. Okay, and then here's something else that's very, very unique if you've got some savvy. The other side of the world is healing. They're reopening. And with the, with the ability to globalization, to communicate on the other side of the world where it's opening up, you can service the other side of the world. Stop looking, everybody wanna come to New York. <laughs> you don't wanna come to New York <laughs> now, <laughs> okay? So, you know, this, this social media, lean, lean into it. So, you know, you're looking at businesses on the other side of the world that are reopening. All right. And then pitch yourself. I would always frame myself. I'm the only one. And I would, you know, I would say glorious things about myself that people would believe, you know, so you, you, you can say to Italy or France or places that are, you know, in front of us, go out into that. You've got friends. You've got friends. Hold on a second. Hold on a second. Now another light bulb went off. So the, the desperation of that person sitting in front of you saying, I can't, all of this happened to me, blah, blah, blah. You've got to have the confidence in yourself to believe that you are good at what you do. You, if I think when people start doubting that, it, they, that really tends to, to, to be the snowball, right? That brings out all that doubt. So how, how, that's an innate quality. That's not something that can be taught. Do you agree with that? Or do you think that that's, you know, you're either born with that or you're not? What do you think? I think, I think where we are right now, you're going to find yourself. So <laughs> you're going to find yourself. In other words, desperation, desperation enough will make you like push yourself, push yourself. You know, I had an inner thrust, you know, it, it, like I said, call me again and I'll tell you about my upbringing and how I got this way. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but a lot of it comes from self and being backed up against the wall and you've got to, um, really design your life out of this. And so you will reach higher. Here's the key. You got to reach bigger and higher in order to get what you need. If you just if you just reach to where you think, you're always going to be on, on you're always going to be wanting. You've got to reach high. Okay? Call the person that you think won't answer. And a lot of this is I've learned to market myself. 
okay, you, I've learned to sell myself. And all of this is, I'm telling you, I got something different and you want it. Okay. But uh, that comes, the confidence comes with spending time to really know that it factor. Okay. I'm one of a kind and so are you. And every designer under the sound of my voice is one of a kind. And you've come to, you've come to, um, you, you've come to be the solution, but you've got to have eyes to see the need. You've got to have eyes to see the need or you, or you won't survive. So, you know, after this, just take some quiet time. And so let's, can, you know, let me, let me, I think this is into the next, a part of the next question. Let, let's, let's look at some leaning into, like right now, I leaned into them. Look, at look, listen, I had someone to ask me, here's an example. Um, my images are on Fine Art America. It's print on demand. Is that what I want? No, that's not what I wanted, but that's what's flourishing. I made more money last week on Fine Art America. Who knew? Who absolutely knew? Okay, so I did a couple of some, you know, a couple of images you can print on demand mask. My masks are going nuts. Fashion mask. Okay, I'm like, so so listen carefully. So, so someone on Facebook, a, a genetic biological, I got a whole nother story, cousin says, can you make a mask for my daughter who is deaf? She's having a hard time negotiating. And all of a sudden I, I heard a need. And then just a little research, it's like the universe, like you said, the universe starts coming. And I saw the innovation of a mask for deaf, you know, a student. She's a young designer. She made a mask with a, a clear cutout. So it's got a shield in it. Okay, so there's, you know, I'm like, okay, graphics with a mask, with a shield so someone can read your lips. And then it says, you know, I'm like, oh my God, that's being, that's yeah, that's being, you know, innovative. I'm, I'm, I'm watching the, solu the design solutions for, three abreast in an airplane, okay? So designers are putting shields between, you know, between the seats and the middle seat, like on the Amtrak train, twist around going the other direction. I'm like, well, who thought of that? <laughs> That's a great design, okay? And then well, I- Hold on just a second, because now you've, met, you've brought up another important topic when it comes to design. Design isn't just on a paper or wall, medium, it is in everything we touch and feel and use. Is is that correct? So yeah. if you have design capabilities, think beyond your, how can you apply the principles and elements of design into things that we use every day? Lee, the key is to see the need. Yeah. And we don't see the need and we don't see the needs in others. The only thing that we see the need is, oh my God, I got to pay my rent and I no studio is hiring me. <laughs> I'm like, no, see the need. And something in you is the solution. And when you can when you can hear that solution of what you can offer, then you're going to go galloping all around selling, I'm the solution, I'm the solution, I'm the solution, I'm the solution. And after a while, you're gonna wake up and look in the mirror and say, oh my God, I saw a need, I am the solution. And so these, these, um, these things are, I'm watching them. I saw one today. Someone took a baseball hat, the concept of a baseball. No, 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 no. The golfing, the golfing, um, what do you call the it? Golf, the, yeah, the visor. The visor. They took the visor and they attached it to a mask. Uh -huh. Okay, so the mask is attached. The golfers are going. So <laughs> someone saw that. And all of a sudden now you can get a golf visor that's attached. So you put you put the whole thing on. I'm like, wow, that was ingenious. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And I said, and then the graphics that go on that. I'm like, okay. So <laughs> make shovels. Make shovels. <laughs> yeah, make shovels. So it comes from within, Lee. It is. It comes from within. And you've got I to assess the need. And I want to pause for a second. I'm not seeing any comments, but I think that's because, or questions, because we've got technical issues on StreamYard. Um, they're not coming through. 
And I just don't see anything in LinkedIn right now. So if you guys do have questions for Cheryl, please pose them here. If she doesn't get to them uh, live on this call, I'll send them to her and she can follow up with you directly. So let's move on to another one of our questions. Um, again, I want to stay focused on the future. The reason that I, I, I am so attracted to you, Cheryl, in particular, is because we know that past performance can, definitely indicates future um, outcomes, right? So unfortunately, where I sit, we have not listened or paid attention to historical events. And here we are again, right? On so many different levels. And so for design, we don't want to go back to right now, user experience has some challenges, right? They're, they are there. It's very hard for them to really define. The designers know what it is, but when it comes to the economic buyers, they want to do something different. They want to homogenize. They want to consolidate. They want to shorten the design life cycle, right? And so where do you see design fitting into the future of faster, cheaper, um, more iterations, where, where, do, where do you see design in our future? What's wh from what you've seen? Well, I can only liken until the shift into something very similar that happened um, during my era. Okay, all of a sudden the computer came and a little program was bundled on HP computers, laptops called PageMaker. <laughs> yeah, there's that. <laughs> and everybody thought they could do, everybody thought they could do their own brochure then. Believe it or not, that impacted a tremendous amount of people, you know, selling brochures and this, that, and the other. You get a computer that's got PageMaker on and you're in um, do-it-yourself, DIY. And that really put out a lot of people out of business. So what, again, I'm saying is that, here's a simple, here's an example of a simple retool of that, that happens, this is so simple. And we're talking about surviving now, surviving until we get onto the other side of this and to see exactly where everything settles. Let's just take um, Vistaprint. Let's take Vistaprint as an example. Um, Vistaprint, if you have an account, you can order it and it's at your front door tomorrow. But do you know how much of the population can really master Vistaprint? <laughs> not many, not many. I know it's not what we wanna do, but a Vistaprint designer in this hour could probably make a whole lot of money. You're, and that's because you can manage the little technology, be a consultant, put, put profit on the printing, work with somebody, push a button, and it's there tomorrow. I'm saying this is a place of survival. And this retooling, of, I would love to say, um, We've just got to get real in some of the loftiness. You know, um, we've, we've got to get through this and this is going to last for a while. So the answer to your question is still the same thing for me. And that is, I still have the same answer. You've got to lean into this and, and then also don't be afraid to retool yourself by taking on one of these master classes, okay? And working with people. All right, my, my fine art America, everybody's got one, finally worked and it's been loaded and ready. But I, I took a three day boot camp with somebody, I, I, I took a boot camp that, you know, the lady knew what she was talking about. And I, I locked down, told my house, I'm, I'm busy for three days, four hours, 12 hours. And then, you know, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, me who knows everything about art, I sat and listened. And Monday morning, I heard how to click and turn the key. And I've been selling crazy on Fine Art America. Who sells on Fine Art America? Nobody. <laughs> but I do. All right. So, so all I'm sharing with you is that we have to um, 
retool, replan, change, change some of our expectations and look for the opportunity. And when I told you about that Vista print, that is real. Okay, because I and you know, because I'm 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 a I'm a publication lady, Vista print. I'm like, oh my God, I can have Zoom Vista print hours, do somebody's job right here on Zoom. Okay. Sh square, um, what do you call it? Share, share screen. You give me your account number, you hit my 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 um Venmo Zelle, PayPal, Apple Pay, we work together, we push a button, your product is there tomorrow. This is what I mean about totally. Right. I, I, I just, you're, thinking like, you're thinking like a businesswoman. And I think that's where I think that's where people get stuck in the 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 emotion of their work. And designers and we know artists are very emotional about about their work and they have every right to be. But there's something again, there's something else I picked out of what you are saying is that you have this tremendous confidence. Right? That's first and foremost but you also have a tremendous amount of humility because it takes a lot of humility to say, I don't know something. I need to keep learning in order to keep moving. I must learn. So the question then becomes is humility. A, is that an inside job only, or can we learn that? How did you get to that point of saying, or is it just right? Yeah. A learner is always going to be a learner, right? But what if you're not intuitively a learner? You're not, automatically job. What do you say to those people? I don't want to learn anymore. I'm done. Well, if it's not working, you better ask somebody something. <laughs> okay. If you're over the cold medicines aren't working. Okay. If you tried everything that you can get from CVS, <laughs> then, oh God, I got to go to the doctor. Go find somebody who can look in and say, oh, I can, you know, I've been coaching designers since 1974. I can listen to you. Honestly, very rarely do I not see it's it, and, and my discipline. I'm not going to I'm not going to coach something that I don't know. OK, so my discipline, my portion of design, I can listen to a career and I'm looking at it and I'm like, OK. All right. There's your crease. Let's iron it out. OK. Um, and so asking for help, it usually comes when you're frustrated and it's not working. If you've taken all your over the cold medicines and no more trips to Walgreens and CVS, you got to go. All right. And so sometimes, you know, sometimes you have to accept that. And then you just kind of glean and wait till somebody shows up that like, oh, that person knows what they're doing, you know. And for me, like I said, I've got online galleries. I got all of them, nothing and every kind of beautiful kind of piece of artwork. And I'm like, OK, all right. So now I'm pushed. I can't depend on my canvases. I can't depend on wine and cheese. I can't invent, you know, I can't depend on that. But what are you going to depend on? And you're not going back to design. Okay. You're not going back to servicing clients and you you built all of this up. So I said, you know, and, and then life just has a way this class popped up. I've been watching, you know, this particular, um, you know, uh, uh, artist she's selling, she's doing online and I'm like, She's got a boot camp. It was price white. She just got me. And I sat with her for three days, tw four hours a day, 12 hours and Monday morning. And here's the other thing we do, Lee. Don't ask me how to do something. And then you want to tweak and twist it and turn it. Monday morning, I did exactly what the lady told me to do. <laughs> I spent 12 hours and paid for her to tell me what to do. Now, if I want to say, oh, I don't believe that. I don't think it work. I'm going to go back okay, and do the same thing I was doing, then you wasted your time and your money. I did exactly what she said to do. And now my gallery is selling, okay? Wow. So, so a lot of times, you know, it's the willingness to let someone speak into your life. Excellent. And we've got a question from the group from one of our audience members, Christina Jackson. I believe Christina's in Connecticut as well. You might even be neighbors. Who knows? Christina says, I'm wondering what Cheryl thinks about the progress that's occurred in terms of diversity, equity, and inclusion in the design profession. Also, what do you think we should be doing that we're not doing? Well, funny you should ask. <laughs> <laughs> You've got 10 minutes to go. <laughs> How many more minutes? 10. 10. Okay. First off, I collect all of the faux pas. All of them. As many of them as I can. All right. And I, if I, I say this all the time, 
if I were practicing in New York City in this day and hour, I would have one of the largest, most sought after corporate communications design firm on the face of the earth. <laughs> and you say, why? Because I will dare and walk in and say, I've looked at, and I've got on, on LinkedIn, I've got this hashtag, fire the art director, hire designers, diverse designers. Every time I see one of these stupid faux pas on my LinkedIn, fire the art director. If you mix up Patti LaBelle <laughs> and um, Aretha Franklin, if you put up a product and black Twitter takes you down, you should be <laughs> at that company. Okay, they launch these products. Look, look at the cycle. Okay, they launch a product on Friday and black Twitter has you down by Saturday afternoon. Monday morning, I wouldn't wait for a firm. I would be knocking right on the diversity and inclusion person's door or the president. You should see my client list that goes to Stanford, okay? My notes are at Stanford. You should see my letters of who I was writing to. I was not, Lowlanders is not who I was writing to. I wrote crazy Cheryl Miller. I wrote the president, the chairman of the board, every time I saw they needed me, every time. And every time black Twitter takes you down, you on Monday morning, you find that corporation and say, listen, let me help you, I'm the solution. And I tell you, if I was doing this, let me tell you, I would have myself a firm because I'm crazy enough. <laughs> Christina, when this is over, meet me in Stanford. I am crazy enough to call you on Monday morning and say, Black Twitter took you down. You don't want to do that, okay? Black, you don't want Black Twitter to take you down after you did all of this rollout. And, and then you need statistics. I want to know how that faux pas, you can't just walk in and say, well, I'm having a hissy fit because I didn't like that. How did that affect the stock market on Monday morning? What you did on Friday, how did that, how did that affect you Monday morning? See, when you can have that kind of research, see, that's why my article and all these things, I just didn't back up, I was having a hissy fit. I went in and I said, you know, you need me because this happened to you. I would walk, I would walk in, okay? I would walk in and say, Black Twitter took you down. Look at your stock market. So now let me help you. And listen, back in the day in your business league, all right, there were only a few, there were only a few headhunters, okay? And I went to one in particular and I said, you want to know where the black designers are? You want to start putting them in? I know where they are. Let me, let, let, let me sift the community and, and give you some so you can place. So you've not just given us a couple of shovels. You've given us an entire, uh, you know, storage shed of shovels <laughs> on this call today. <laughs> so, well, honest. The problem with me is I could go on and on and on and on. <laughs> okay. uh, okay. else? Uh, Christina says, I am there. Darren Hood is going yes with exclamation points. <laughs> and so, so uh, we are on fire here. So let's get to, we've got um, about six minutes left on this call. Mm -hmm. And that went really, really fast. So um, you keep, you always, throughout this conversation, I think you've given the future designer enough tidbits already. But what I'm, I really want to draw on right now is your ability to tie what you do to business. You have throughout all of this shown a, um, sh you've connected the dots. If you're being brought down on black Twitter, how does that affect you on the stock market? And how do where they're not teaching business acumen in design school if i don't believe that they are where did you learn all that how did you understand business and where you fit into business well uh first off it is gift okay a part of it is gift yeah and, and then it helps i'm married to an mba <laughs> <laughs> so right. the, the two I'm, I'm married to a businessman okay so and i've been with him since i was 16. so but wow. so between a giftedness, I have a giftedness to sell myself. I make you a believer. I make you a believer because I believe in myself, okay? And um, the rest of it, I, I learned from going to business school with my husband. In other words, we, we were young and married and, you know, I watched his career. 
I watched his career soar. I went through, you know, business school at, on my dining room table. And what I learned, which is key, if you don't know anything else, you must know a typical basic corporate organizational chart. And on that chart, you have to know your little square. That is my client. Okay. You have to know that target client. Don't worry about everybody else in the corporation. You just have to know who it is that will order your work. And you only sell to that person. That doesn't mean structurally. So I knew that the C EVP, SVP of corporate communications was my square. Okay. Got a little square and you got your charts and this, that, and the other. Once you target that, every time I would go out or every time I would write a letter, I wanted to meet the EVP of corporate communications. I wouldn't spend a time, a dime, anything, unless I, I wouldn't leave my office, a stamp back in the day, packages, nothing. I knew, I knew my, right down that structure. I wouldn't go all over the place. And now all over the place came to me, but I would only pitch one, find your chart and find out who's your client right there. That's by fancy books, fancy books came out of corporate communications. Now they might've gotten spewed out to back then it was equal opportunity office. Then it changed to social responsibility office. And now it's the same office, DNI office. Okay. Wow. All right. And he would, he would open up that EVP would open up. Okay. Now you're going over here. You're going to do a fancy social responsibility book because it all, it all the communications, all of it would come out of. So I, you have to know that one little block who is buying. Okay. And if you want to do a studio, that's your prime. That's who gets your invoice. That's who's sending you cash to pay your, to, to pay your studio bills. Okay. And once you know that target client, don't sell to anybody else. Everybody else is going to come. Can you do a logo? Can you do an ad? Can you do this? Can you do that? But at the end of the day, it was that fancy book that paid my bill. And so I would only, you know, it's like growing a garden, you know, okay. Broccoli sells for me, but all of a sudden, you know, out there growing for years, do I have tomatoes and cucumbers and cauliflower? Yeah. It's all going perennial. All it's all going out there all by itself. But every month, I mean, every year I would only plant broccoli because broccoli was my big ticket item. So that's a part of it, being focused. Who, who is going to facilitate my invoice, okay? When you can identify that person on a corporate structure, and if you don't know who it is, I was crazy enough, I would write the president of the company or chairman of the board. There you go. I would write You're on that, Cheryl. I, I agree with you. I think that's that's where you need to start. I really and, then, and then what I did was what a lot of people don't think to do is I bought overs of every product I produce. Two hundred. That's how I have a collection. Two hundred and fifty to a thousand samples. I would buy overs or built it into the printing costs. So I would just send a book to the president and say, "I'd like to do work with you." It wasn't anything. I, you know, I saw a big proposal statement and all of that, all of that, all of that, all of that coming out from the organizations and so forth and so on. Look, in many cases back then, I would send a pretty book and say, you know, president so-and-so, I would like to do that. Can you please, can you please direct me to the EVP of corporate communications? And sure enough, nine out of 10 times, I would get the call back. Ms. Miller, can you come in and show us your work? You know, we have a project, but da, da 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 I'm always selling Cheryl D. Miller art one way or the other. And we're going to end with that note. <laughs> so, so our time is up and I do want to encapsulate what you just said. So ideally you want to send a sample of your work and how it can help your targeted buyer. So it's, it's it's what what is that that can help you too? Okay. So I you want are, to have a closing sentence if you ask me. So you, you got have, that? have a closing sentence if okay, you say yes. we're going to turn it over to you to close us out for one minute. Go ahead. Okay. First off, I've invited everybody to find me on LinkedIn. 
I invite everybody to my online and buy and, buy, yes. and, buy, yes. and, and print it on a cup. It's so crazy. CDMillerFineArt.com. C- Go have fun with that. <laughs> okay. But here's, here's my last message. Okay. And you can write me on. You, yes, I'll talk to you. Yes, I will talk to you. I've been talking to designers since 1974. Okay. Here's my motto. To live your life is your story. To live your life for others is your legacy. Leave a a legacy. Leave a legacy. Cheryl, what an honor. An honor honor (laughs) to have you here today. And if if you're part of our audience today and you don't walk away inspired, motivated, and driven to to follow the inner calling that you have, I'm sending you to Cheryl so that she can remind you. What, what's going on. So anyway, thank you so much for joining us, everybody. I don't see any other questions. Um, lots of thank yous, um, Cheryl. And so uh, we're going to sign out for today. Again, everybody have a great day and do me a favor, follow that passion because you've only got one shot at this place, right, Cheryl? We've only got one shot at this and uh, we do have to make it count. So okay. God bless you. Be safe, stay home, wear your mask, and um, I'll see you, definitely see you. Uh, zoom in all over the place. Call me, find me on LinkedIn. Thank you, Lisa. <laughs> we will. Thank you so much. Bye, right. everyone. Let's see. Let's, how do we?